Nicholson. So good evening to you all and welcome to the Frontline Club. Um, yes, my name's Paola Totoro. I'm an Australian correspondent and I'm president of the Foreign Press Association in London at the moment. I'm absolutely delighted to be here tonight, not only to hear my Australian colleague, Julie Pozzetti's groundbreaking work on source protection, but also to hear our panel and your views and your experiences, hopefully, on what must surely be one of the most issues for journalism in modern times. Now, Julie's study for the World Association of News Publishers is called Protecting Journalism Sources in the Digital Age. It'll be published by UNESCO in the next couple of months. But tonight, we're going to hear some of the findings and the recommendations from this work. It's 80,000 word tome. At the moment. And, uh, <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> apparently may get bigger. Um, the work so far suggests, in no uncertain terms, that legal source protection frameworks in many of the 121 countries that were studied by the researchers are not only outdated, but there's now an urgent need for both debate and action to explore how journalism can be shielded from surveillance from the state or institutional demands for handover of material connected to our sources and communications with them. Now, it seems outlandish to, to say this in this day and age of smartphones and laptops, but massive surveillance may well see us all return to the old school, to that kind of shoe leather journalism that Bernstein and Woodward did, the, you know, the, the clandestine sort of meetings in underground car parks to ensure that our own deep throats are protected. How else are we going to do it? But before we go on and down that path, I'd like to introduce you to Julie and to our esteemed panel. So Julie is, of course, an Australian journalist and journalism academic. She's a former news editor and presenter and political reporter with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC. Julie has spent the last 18 months in Paris as a research fellow with the World Editors Forum and the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers, one IFRA. She's completing a PhD on the Twitterisation of journalism at the University of Wollongong, Australia, where she teaches social journalism, radio, TV, and multimedia storytelling. And I think she's set up a hashtag, haven't you? Uh, well, I, I, just, <laughs> I just plucked Save Our Sources from the Air, which is one that has been used by various groups campaigning for better source uh, protection. Yep. So, save, hash Save Our Sources will do for tonight. <laughs> Great. Now, on my right on the end is um, Gavin Miller, QC, who has a, a broad practice spanning media, information, public, criminal, employment and discrimination law. He's one of our most, Britain's most noted specialists um, in the areas of media law uh, and obviously in areas of defamation, privacy, breach of confidence, publishing contempts and reporting restrictions. He's got some fantastic stories to tell, um, which he was regaling us with a little earlier. He often represents media outlets, journalists and politicians in both civil and criminal proceedings. On my right is Jonathan Calvert, who's the longest serving editor of the Sunday Times Insight team in its 50 year history. He's held this incredible position for a decade. His first scoop for the team was exposing the cash for questions scandal as an undercover Insight reporter in 1994. And he soon after became the investigations editor at The Observer, where he saw, oversaw a, a string of major exclusives and has ever since. Since he returned to the Sunday Times, he's headed a long line of exclusives and most recently you'll know the FIFA files in investigations which made waves and continues to make waves around the world. And last but not least is Paul Myers, who's on my left, and he's a BBC internet research specialist. Now, he joined the BBC in 1995 as a news information researcher, but has actually been working computers since 1978, which is, and he'll tell you a bit more about his history there, which is extraordinary. He also runs the, uh, the Internet Research Clinic, which is a website which is dedicated to directing journalists to the best research links, apps, and resources. In the, ABC, in the BBC Academy, um, his role sees him organise and deliver training courses related to internet investigation, um, data journalism, freedom of information, reporting statistics, working with social media. He also teaches people to cover up their tracks um, in, in the most kind of <laughs> uh, uh, way. Now, he's worked with leading programmes like Panorama, <laughs> Watchdog, national news bulletins, BBC Online, local and national radio, and the World Service. Now, 
what we'd like to do is for our speakers to comment briefly um, after Julie has given her presentation, and then we'd really love you to ask questions. Open it up to the floor, microphones, and, uh, and a good debate. So, Julie, Great. over to you. Thanks very much for coming. Um, this is a really important debate. I think it's fundamental to the future of journalism, particularly investigative journalism. And I'm really honoured to be here, especially among such a, a, a fantastic um, group of people on the stage here. Um, I should start by saying that uh, while I'm talking about this study, which was commissioned by UNESCO, which is uh, in the process of uh, being finally edited, it's in the, the final phase of editing, which is why I said that um, the 80,000 words is, is potentially nominal at this point. Um, I'm not representing UNESCO, I need to make that clear, that's my big caveat from, from the outset. I'm going to share um, some of the findings and uh, some of the recommendations from the, the study with you. Um, and it's, been, it's a huge study, it's been a massive um, amount of work and we had a, a great team of uh, research assistants, one of whom Federica Cherubini is, is here this evening, which is um, wonderful. It's, um, it's a moving feast. It's like working on a, a breaking story for a year and a half, basically, because this beast keeps shifting. Um, Alan Rusbridger, who I interviewed uh, for the study, said to me that he felt that dealing with um, the threat uh, to the protection of sources in the digital age was a lot like fighting zombies. You know, Every time you think you've, you've solved a problem, every time you think you've confronted one of these beasts, um, another one will pop up, another door will open. And that, you know, a lot of people have said to me through the course of um, the research that you start to feel like you're wearing a tinfoil hat, that, you know, that you become deeply paranoid. I actually can really appreciate why uh, people have become so concerned and why it feels like a zombie war. Um, and I think I'll start by just sharing with you um, three or four of the key cases that um, emerged from from our research and we, we did look at 121 countries and they represented every one of um, UNESCO's regions, so from uh, Europe and North America through to Africa, the Arab states, Latin America and the Caribbean and Asia, so this is very vast. Um, but several uh, cases stood out to me as examples and still stand out, examples um, of the genuine threat to investigative journalism posed by as the erosion of source protection in the digital age. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware that just last week, um, Der Spiegel and, um, in collaboration, CNN, revealed that um, through the course of a um, hearing in Germany, the head of the German intelligence service um, effectively confirmed that during 2011, he had had a meeting with the CIA bureau chief in Berlin who told them that they had Der Spiegel journalists under surveillance and identified one of the confidential sources that Der Spiegel was relying upon in their reporting. And that journalist, um, uh, sorry, that source was um, a, a, a German citizen. Subsequently, that source, who was in fact very senior in the German um, intelligence service, who was a subordinate to the chief, was moved to a job as an archivist. Um, so what we have here is a situation where a journalist's confidential communications <coughs> with their sources, or with their source in this case, was exposed through surveillance, not just exposed um, by the, the, the perpetrators of the surveillance, if you like, but was then shopped effectively by one government to another. Um, and that, I think, really underlines the, the significance of the struggle that we're dealing with, um, with there. It really, it really emphasises the role of mass surveillance, if you like, and targeted surveillance, um, theoretically, in undercutting uh, legal source protection frameworks. It's all very well to say I can stand up in court and protect my source, but if my source has been exposed in a clandestine manner, it becomes um, quite um, Al Jazeera in 2013, Der Spiegel again, um, in this case, revealed that Al Jazeera's communications had um, been intercepted and read by the NSA. Um, and that was because, um, according to documents that had been leaked by Snowden, um, the agency viewed Al Jazeera as, quote, an interesting target. We then heard uh, earlier this year, as revealed by The Guardian, again coming from uh, the Snowden files, that GCHQ, your own, one of your own intelligence services in the UK, had siphoned emails from some of the world's top news organisations so those titles included The Guardian, Le Monde, Reuters, the BBC, Times and the Washington Post. 
There was a case also in Poland where um, a magazine journalist uh, had been reporting on um, allegations of irregularities within the security service in Poland. That journalist discovered that his uh, communications had been intercepted and ultimately took action in a, a district court in Warsaw. The court found in his favour um, and despite the security agency appealing the decision, the appeal lost and the agency was ordered to delete um, the, the intercepted communications. Of course, can you unsee something when it's been, once it's been seen is, is the question. You know, what is the real effect of that kind of um, decision? And very recently in uh, Macedonia, or the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, it was revealed that um, over 20,000 citizens had been subjected to what was being described as unauthorised surveillance. Um, about a hundred of the journalists, a hundred of the people involved rather, were journalists, um, and that was revealed by an opposition leader who actually called the journalists up to come and collect transcripts of their communications that had been intercepted. So you can see that, you know, this is, uh, this is not some kind of, um, you know, fantasy that there, is a, that there is a threat. There are tangible examples. We've also seen um, a situation emerge where um, national security legislation, where anti-terrorism legislation is um, these um, attempts to protect sources as well. So the, the broadening of definitions of what is um, classification under such acts is problematic. Even more problematic is the fact that, um, again, as revealed by uh, some of the, the documents um, released by Snowden, that an in, in information security assessment um, in the UK found that investigative journalists in a threat hierarchy were listed alongside hackers and terrorists. So these are the sorts of discourses that, <laughs> that we're dealing with, where journalists are, are seen as a threat and where action is taken um, potentially against them. So let's uh, think about this research. Let's look at this research um, and think about what it means for, um, for our work. And, I, and I'll give you the headlines um, appropriately. We've found that legal frameworks that support the protection of journalistic sources at the international level, at the regional level, and at the level are under significant strain in 2015. They're increasingly at risk of erosion, restriction and compromise. Uh, and that develops a direct challenge to the established universal uh, rights, human rights, to privacy. One of uh, the impacts of the erosion of those rights is the fact that it poses a threat to the sustainability of investigative journalism, which is why people are asking, is it possible to do investigative journalism now? We found that there's a need to revise and strengthen the laws that do exist to respond to the challenges of the digital age, that's globally, or to introduce them where they don't exist. We also believe that acts of journalism should be shielded from targeted surveillance and data retention and the handover of material uh, by third parties or state agencies um, to others. So in other words, when we think about the impact of data retention legislation, the ability of um, a state to access your phone records, your email records, um, through a demand that is put to an intermediary such as an ISP or um, an, an email provider or um, a social media network, the ability to demand that handover based on increasingly long periods of time that that information is kept for becomes even more problematic. We found also um, that of the 121 UNESCO states, 2007 when the last major study occurred, there have been developments in this arena in 70% of those states. So there's evidence of significant movement in this field. And in many of those countries, we found, um, some of which I've indicated already, but we found that the laws that existed were being trumped by national security and anti-terrorism legislation. We found that those laws were being undercut by surveillance, both mass surveillance and targeted surveillance, being jeopardised by that act of mandatory data retention, outdated when it comes to regulating digital data, 
and challenged by questions of um, entitlement to protection. So when sources go direct, when we have well-established patterns of public journalism and citizen reporting, who's entitled to claim protection under the laws that do exist? Are bloggers covered? Are human rights activists covered? There's a, a range of challenges around defining who is a journalist and also what is journalism, which are questions that we've been struggling with for well over a decade, but they have direct um, <coughs> implications for source protection. Um, in terms of the scope of the research, we did um, a vast amount of online research. We also surveyed 130 people, experts in journalism, um, human rights, um, freedom of expression, law, and we interviewed um, 50 of those experts. So there's a huge amount of um, data involved in this study and it stretches um, across the planet, really. So we've thought about some of the impacts that we think need to be highlighted um, for um, action. And some of the impacts of what, what I've just described include the ability through exposure for people with a vested interest to um, trigger cover-ups, intimidation, um, destroy information. So this is you know, a direct effect on the journalistic process. It's also possible and potentially much more serious that um, a source's identity, once revealed, could lead to retribution, could lead to even physical harm. We then have the situation that whistleblowers, many of whom are journalist sources, uh, start to feel that they cannot trust the processes, um, start to feel that it's, it's not safe for them to communicate. So there's a chilling effect um, at play here. And then we have the risk of self-censorship on the part of journalists who are, in many states, the consequences for, for an investigative uh, process being revealed are severe. It may not necessarily be here, but in developing contexts, in contexts of conflict, for example, it's very problematic. So we've found that um, journalists around the world are increasingly and significantly changing their practices as a means of trying to address these problems. They are, for example, going back to analogue basics. I mean, the, the dark car park meeting <laughs> was mentioned to be more times than I can count in, uh, in interviews and discussions with journalists around the world. It's not necessarily happening at the rate that perhaps it should. It's not necessarily um, happening from management down, but journalists who are aware of the problem um, and editors who are aware of the problem are triggering change practices. I had one editor-in-chief from Argentina tell me that his chief investigative reporter drove three hours um, without any kind of electronic equipment, um, sticking to back roads to meet a source and drove three hours back to avoid um, interception. That's just one anecdote <laughs> from, uh, from this work. We found um, that in addition to um, those sorts of analog practices, of course there is, and hopefully we'll hear from from you about that, <laughs> in terms of digital security practices, there are certainly measures that can be taken and increasingly they are being taken. But those measures uh, tend to be costly and they also um, increasingly involve the need for um, legal interventions, which Gavin I'm sure will talk about and Gavin was one of the legal experts I interviewed for the study. Um, and if we have a situation where, for example, encryption is disallowed, which I know has been country. Um, the, the, the idea that you know you might disallow encryption. Um, you are in a situation where the attempt to mitigate these effects is, is becomes even more problematic. Um, and then what if your sources are unaware of the risks? You may have taken all of these measures, but the first contact they make with you may expose them. If they themselves have no idea about how to secure their communications, what are the implications of that? So we think that there needs to be um, systems put in place that encourage and support transparency and accountability when it, comes to, when it comes to surveillance and data retention. Um, we think that states, all member states of UNESCO in this case, need to take steps to adopt and update um, and strengthen source protection laws. We think that journalists need um, training in digital safety and security tactics. And perhaps journalists need to start thinking about training sources. Um, again, it's not an easy decision to make, it's potentially problematic, but how do you 
you know, maintain uh, relationships with confidential sources um, and how do you progress in the absence of improved laws? This is a challenge. Um, and I'll say, you know, at a personal level, there are ethical challenges here too. How do you actually say to a journalist, I promise uh, to protect your identity anymore? You know, what kind of caveats need to be in place um, from an ethical point of view? So we need also to um, ensure that um, it's not just the publication that's protected. It's not just a case of the journalist being prevented um, or, or the journalist being obliged and being able to um, defend their right not to disclose a, a, a source in a legal action. It's also a case, we would argue, that journalistic communications need to be protected. So the journalistic process, the email communications, the phone calls, the protections that exist need to extend to those kinds of communications and they certainly need to extend to digital reporting equipment, for example. So where we have in some countries around the world the argument that, um, you know, the police can't seize your notepad but they can take your hard drive, which comes up over and over and over again. You were in a very um, you know, difficult situation in, in 2015. We are no longer in an analogue reporting world and it's very hard to go back as much as you might um, do so in you know, specific circumstances where you know there's a risk. Uh, there's also the reality that you may work on a pretty, you know, um, what seems like a rudimentary story, something about, um, you know, some sort of story about a doctor's strike that leads to some kind of revelation about corruption in a hospital. You don't know necessarily when you embark on an investigation that this story is going to become highly sensitive and potentially expose you and your source to those kinds of acts. So I'll stop talking now because I really want to get to the other speakers and also trigger a debate. But I do want to point to um, an 11 point plan, which is, I'm going to tweet a link already up online, so I'll share that with you um, digitally. <laughs> and that 11 point plan we're recommending for adoption globally, it serves as a framework for countries to be able to check the effectiveness of their source protection um, uh, elements, the framework for source protection against this global framework which we hope will be useful uh, to journalists, to, um, to governments, to lawyers in an effort to try to um, reach some fundamentally um, important benchmarks in terms of uh, progressing uh, attempts to preserve the relationship between confidential sources and journalists in the digital age. Thank Julie, you. thanks very much. That was quite fascinating. Kevin, do you want to start to, to, to give us a little bit of a, <coughs> a sense of the framework in the UK and how, how things operate, how, how you see them as you work? Sure. Um, our law, the common law, um, has uh, caught up with developments in Europe. It's taken a while. Um, but most of our source protection law that's of any use uh, has come from European institutions, including the Court of Human Rights. Um, in 1994, the EU and the Council of Europe promulgated instruments uh, explaining the importance of the right of journalistic source protection and familiar principle, now familiar principles about how it should only be overridden in very limited exceptional circumstances. Um, there was then a groundbreaking case Goodwin, a journalist in 1996 in Strasbourg, in which the Court of Human Rights laid down the fundamental principle that there's a strong presumptive right of source protection, it can only be overridden um, where there is an overriding public interest throw into the balance against the constant and high public interest in a democracy of protecting journalistic sources. Uh, and uh, there should be careful scrutiny by a court of the state, the state's justification in any particular case for saying those requirements were met. Uh, and it was assumed that, that thereafter, here at any rate, that those principles would be adhered to and judges would be involved in this process. There are various vehicles in our law through which the state can obtain or private individuals can get a judge to order or disclosure of material identifying uh, a source. Um, but in essence, we had managed to develop the law through the cases we did 
all in all of through all of those vehicles and in all those possible situations, witness summons, production order applications, and so on, um, to these simple principles that a judge should do it, that there should be careful scrutiny of the evidence and the facts, and this overriding public interest test would be strictly and rigorously applied. Plus, you avoid disproportionate disclosure. So only what's strictly necessary for the um, aim that's being pursued, terrorism investigation, national security, whatever it may be. Um, uh, and um, it was all well and good. We were educating the judges and we were getting the idea of source protection into the public domain. Sneaking up behind us had been the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000, REPA as we call it in the trade. Um, which is a very complicated piece of legislation that was passed to bring the law relating to the use of covert powers in this country by state agencies uh, into the <coughs> 21st century. Um, and for those of you who don't know how it works, um, essentially it covers three types of covert activity. Intercepts, um, which could be in various forms, but it's intercepting content. So we're talking about the police MI5, MI6, GCHQ here, and the authorization for intercepts, uh, obtaining and disclosing data. Again, the same agencies involved. You get authorization to go to a service provider and get metadata, um, which is the information about your traffic, who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, GPRS data, where you're moving around, all that sort of stuff from your mobile phone. And lastly, the, our old friend, human sort of human secret surveillance, covert human intelligence sources, um, uh, putting bugs in cars and, and houses and sneaking around corners behind people, seeing what they're doing. Um, and um, the, there, was an there was an understanding misplaced that, that that stuff didn't go on where the purpose of exercising the power was to identify a journalistic source. Um, that the... Uh, the bad is would become good is, and that they would use these judicial processes and ensure that there was a proper consideration of this highly developed and very favorable law. And that's all um, gone down the pan in recent years, unfortunately, thereby um, opening up a whole new line of work for me, which is obviously <laughs> very, is, is, is a useful side effect of it. <laughs> um, um, and. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we find that these powers are being used to circumvent all those protections that existed in European law and that we'd brought into, into our law. And this is something that's been said repeated, had been said repeatedly in, in European instruments to be an absolute no-no, going back, uh, ironically, to 2000, the same year Reaper was adopted. The, the, the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers, the EU, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, has said in unequivocal terms, you cannot circumvent um, these protections for journalists by using covert powers. You simply can't do it. And um, on top of that, uh, in recent years, um, there have been some cases in Strasbourg where they have said, both the Grand Chamber and uh, in a case involving covert surveillance of some Dutch journalists, Absolutely not, you can't do it. If you want to do anything like that, you've got to get prior judicial scrutiny of the grounds and the case for using covert surveillance. And the judge has to be, has to be a judge independent of the executive of the law enforcement agency and has to understand these principles, look at the evidence, interrogate the case uh, rigorously and decide whether there is an overriding public interest to allow surveillance of that sort. Um, and that's all very clear, but what turns out to be the case is that in this jurisdiction, um, the uh, law enforcement agencies had got into the habit of the self-help remedies that are available under REAPER and doing this without being involved. So Section 8 warrants in Part 1, Chapter 1 of REAPER are signed off by ministers to enable wholesale data collection of the sort and uh, the police and other agencies um, self-authorize, if you like, the use of the other surveillance powers uh, in REPA. And this began to emerge through some, some cases 
uh, the use of targeted surveillance emerged in the Chris Hume case and in the Plebgate case involving police investigations uh, into cases involving cabinet ministers. There's a strange correlation between political embarrassment and abuse of state power when it comes to journalistic sources, both in the Strasbourg cases and in our own cases. It's weird that I can't figure out why that, why that <laughs> happens. Um, and uh, also, at one stage, I thought it was only in my cases this is happening, because they were both my cases. But I'm sure <laughs> events have revealed that it happens in a lot of other cases. So there's this huge known unknown of, of self-authorization, self to use those powers, to target journalists for the purpose of obtaining uh, the identity of a source. And there is no judge involved. Right? So the legislation is not convention compliant anymore. And, and indeed never was. Worse still, we find out that, um, so that's one thing, targeting uh, material and, and uh, uh, journalist sources. The other is this mass data harvesting that Snowden revealed, which is a different problem, but the same end result, which is that you can trawl through the material, and by that different route, you can suddenly find out lots about what journalists are doing and who their sources are. And that raises a whole different set of problems, although the same principle should apply, that there should be proper prior judicial scrutiny of any warrant that goes beyond targeted surveillance of that sort that might, that might affect journalists. So I have a case coincidentally coming up in two weeks in the Investigatory Powers Tribunal in this country, which is the supervisory jurisdic uh, jurisdiction for complaints against uh, in relation to the use of these powers, in the Sons case, the Tom Newton Dunn case, where um, sources were source, sources were identified in communications data of journalists and the newspaper, and we have uniquely in this country not only an admission from the police they did it, which I think they're rather regretting having made <laughs> now, but um, we have the tribunal has forced disclosure out of them of the documentation showing the procedure by which these authorizations are granted. And how the judge, how the journalist, how the uh, officer who does it pretends to be the judge, if I can put it that way, um, without the competence or the inclination to behave like a judge. So that's going to be a very interesting case, and that will raise directly for the first time in this country the non compliance of our law with the principle that there should be prior judicial scrutiny. Um, so keep an eye out for that one. Meanwhile, we've also launched a case for the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which has gone to Strasbourg and been expedited, which is on the back of the Snowden revelations, which challenges on the much bigger issue of um, not only judicial authorization beforehand, but how you sift through the material afterwards when you've got it, and, and whether you should, in effect, treat journalistic material of this sort like legally privileged material and force intelligence agencies to say, as they, as they should do with privileged material, right? The moment we realize we've got something in the net that's privileged, we depart the scene, we hand it over to an independent person, a lawyer, a judge, whoever it may be, to look at it and decide what, if anything, there we can look at. And um, we need to get some sort of clear guidelines promulgated by GCHQ and the agencies, both as to how they get prior authorization and what they do with this material afterwards. I have to say, so I'm going to finish in a minute, I know it's very long. I have to say that um, my um, inclination is to say that there is such a huge cultural problem now in law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies that doing what Julia's report very clearly explains you need to do, which is to have black letter legislation that meets certain key principles, is all fine and dandy but it ain't gonna be worth a hill of beans if they don't play ball, if the culture within those organizations is not <coughs> rule of law compliant and, and, and strictly and, and, and enthusiastically rule of law compliant. And I don't think it is. I don't even know to what extent they're sidestepping even REAPA, even the REAPA authorizations. I suspect they are, and they're using technological advances um, to do that. And um, unless we can, bring about a, it, that sort of cultural change, which is a political problem, then the stuff that I do may be, frankly, completely pointless. And at the moment, there's no sign of that. There's no sign of that because British people are essentially passive about this stuff. They don't provoke politicians into doing anything about it, see the reaction to Snowden. And our politicians are 
sufficiently interested in their own political careers to not to want to ruffle when they're in Parliament the, the feathers of the intelligence feathers agencies. Mm. And they won't exercise any serious oversight through the Intelligence Committee of uh, the Parliamentary Intelligence Committee. So that's a bleak, that's a bleak picture. Pretty and I think black. that's really where I think that's really where the problem is. I think we will get Reaper rewritten. David Anderson, the government's terrorism czar, wrote a very good report a couple of weeks ago suggesting amendments to it, prior judicial authorization, all this sort of stuff. He even nodded towards my submission, which said we need a discreet shield law for journalists in this country, which astonishingly we don't have. We should have a piece of legislation that judges can't ignore that is called the journalistic shield law, whatever it is. Um, we may get all that stuff, but unless we get a major cultural change, we've got a problem. Because they've got used to it. This is lazy intelligence and investigative work. They have realized that journalists are, ha have masses of data, electronic data. And if they can access that, the journalist is doing their job for them. And it's a quick and easy and convenient way of not having to do the foot slogging, the foot -slogging work, police yeah. work that they're forcing journalists back to doing as journalists. Pretty black landscape. I'm just, maybe you could speak now, Jonathan. <laughs> and uh, it's the best of times or the worst of times for an investigative journalist like uh, you? Well, I think it's very much the same as it always was in a funny sort of way. I mean, I'm, I'm an investigative journalist. Um, I sort of always have been aware that private detectives, um, government agencies can, can get access to I mean, it's, um, it's very difficult to protect yourself from that. Um, you know, sources are very, very important to us. We would have no stories without them. We seek them out. They come to us. And we, when we meet them, and you know, we'd rather they were on the record. I mean, it's so much better for sources on the record. But for quite reasonable reasons, sources often want to be off the record. And they, off, and they will often say, it's, they, you know, it's their livelihood or whatever. They, I mean, they genuinely could lose their jobs or, or worse. Um, and so when we say to them that we will protect our identity, we, um, we have to mean it and we have to believe in it. And, we have to, and that means we take it upon ourselves as a, res as a responsibility. Um, and given that we don't know what's out there, given that we only ever get glimpses, occasionally, you know, say, for example, we'll find out the GCXQ are gathering journalist data. Um, occasionally, we'll see a case like the Tom Newton Dunn's where the police were just able to access phone records at, at will almost by just going to a fellow officer. Um, I, sort of, I sort of think our approach to it is, sort of, is just to be low tech about it, um, uh, not to trust computers in that way. Um, and you know, for years we've been doing things like going to internet cafes, using any old hotmail address, using several hotmail addresses, uh, making sure that our, we're not, never connected to our IP address. Um, and even this is not foolproof. I mean, we, you know, we use mobile phones, which are, um, which we can just buy, pay as you go, because you don't have to give your address when you buy them. Um, foolproof, I know, and I know that. And recent, recently, recently, we, um, uh, we, when we did the FIFA files, we, uh, our source was, uh, we had to protect our source. Our source would have lost their job um, and their livelihood entirely. Um, and so we. So we spent three months out in a town somewhere in England, um, away from our homes, um, going through all this data on computers that we, that we had no connection to. We kept our, our communication to the office very, very limited. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I, I know, and, and, and that's the best we can do at the moment because we don't really have and we don't know quite who would be looking at us. And there have been times when we think, well, maybe, you know, the reason that someone responded when we put this allegation to them was because actually they had some prior knowledge because they'd actually been, been looking at us. But we don't know that. And you'd be too paranoid and you would never do the job if you, if you were constantly looking over your shoulder all, all the time. But it, I think it is correct to take reasonable precautions. Um, and... You know, I agree, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it would be, a, a new act of um, freedom um, that would enshrine a privilege in its source would be very good for a healthy um, and you know obviously I would welcome more and more methods to sort of to you know protect that that 
very special relationship between somebody who is often, you know, sort of putting their neck on the line for you. Um, and, you know, you can do everything, uh, most of what you can, but you can't always, you know, sort of absolutely be sure. And now you can tell us about <laughs> some of the, the higher tech things that can be done too. Oh dear. Um, well, I, I teach um, BBC staff uh, how to protect their sources and also digital security. I work with them, we go undercover, um, and I teach from a particularly kind of electronic perspective. Um, although, the, uh, you know, I'm trying to teach best practice where so much of the information is hidden and there's so much folklore that it's like trying to nail a jelly to a raindrop or something. It's, you know, or, or maybe herding cats is another one. Uh, uh, but Very evocative. I know. Right. <laughs> um, but so how do I define the risk when I'm uh, laying this out to people? Well, I would say that there are different spheres of risk, if you like. If you're doing uh, an investigative piece of uh, a kennel in Shropshire that's selling pit bulls under the counter, it's going to be very kind of different to investigating GCHQ. Um, but there's still going to be an element of risk. Uh, you could, for example, um, visit their website and leave a, a footprint from the BBC's IP address. Or you could set up a Hotmail account not realising that Hotmail betrays the fact that you used a BBC computer to visit Hotmail to send that email, and then you're sending in a source undercover into an environment that involves pit bulls under a counter, which is probably the worst place to keep a pit bull. Um, <laughs> and then I suppose there's medium level risk as well, where you, you're dealing with hackers and uh, large corporations that can afford to employ hackers and um, private investigators who can follow you and then you get your top level governments um, where you know they can intercept you at an airport and seize your laptop or they can do man in the middle attacks and read your emails um, if you, you know, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't with encryption you know if you do send an encrypted email then you look awfully suspicious uh, even if they can't understand what you're talking about pick me yeah it's like kind of walking into a bank wearing sunglasses and a fedora and a fake beard <laughs> they don't know who you are but they know you're up to no good um, and so um, you know and, and of course the chain is as weak as its weakest link you know and so I you know I asked Duncan Campbell once whether he uses encryption he says no because it really makes you stick out and even if you encrypt the people that you send it to might decrypt it and send it on, on Claire, so to speak. Uh, and so they're going to know who your contacts are and, you know, you're going to... Well, last time I was in a room with Duncan Campbell, though, he made me put my mobile phone in a biscuit. Too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> and and so, like, you see, I don't, I don't do things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, with we me get now, people you to... Do that now. <laughs> we get people to use burners. But, you know, and, but, you know even within those three spheres, there are technical risks and there are social risks. Like, does anyone know what the opposite of a whistleblower is? Because I, yeah, yeah, you do. Because I came up with the term whistle sucker. You know, it's, um, <laughs> the opposite of a whistleblower. Uh, we had uh, one of our programs was investigating Lutfa Rahman, the uh, erstwhile mayor of Tower Hamlets, and um, and this wasn't really a kind of technical or encryption issue in a way. It was about access, and one of the team. A uh, junior researcher kind of betrayed the identity of our whistleblowers mm -hmm. to Lutva Rahman, who then proceeded to call her a whistleblower for blowing the whistle on our whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. So whistle sucker was what I came up with there. <laughs> um, and then when it comes to the... the um, well, it, it could be other things like, uh, you know, are you pretending to be an American? You know, never pretend to be an American if you're doing undercover work, unless you are American, of course. <laughs> Why? You'd be very well. You know, you have to get up at four in the morning to post because that would be the time that you'd be posting online, and you have to use American spellings and 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 you know, and you That's might not. Spicy. One time, I kind of like, I think uh, I didn't know what the peanut gallery was. Do you know what the peanut gallery is? And somebody said, "Were you born in a cave?" Every American knows howdy doody time, but we don't have howdy doody time <laughs> in the UK. So you know. Never pretend to be American. 
and never pretend to be anyone of the opposite gender because you're going to have to make a phone, phone call eventually as well. <laughs> and then, then there's the hardware things like, okay, well, if you are investigating, uh, you know, government level spheres, then um, do you use Tor? And again, a lot of folklore, you know, Tor is a, a, a free encrypted program that gets you out on the internet and uh, people can't see what you're doing. You go through random computers and, you know, there is this folklore about, well, is it really, really secure? And you just have to kind of do the best you can. Mm. Um, do you use, uh, well, I, I've been playing around with Tails recently, which is a, an operating system that lives on a, a DVD or a flash drive. And you plug it in, and when you turn the computer on, you press uh, a use that instead of Windows, and that's all nicely encrypted and has encrypted email programs and encrypted um, files storage and stuff like that. Um, the, or you could use a black phone, which has been designed for secure communications. But as was mentioned before, sometimes the source will just kind of blurt out on Facebook that they're working with the BBC mm. on a hot <laughs> undercover story. And it, you know, and so you can't really legislate Has that really that, happened? You know. Or in a chat room? Yeah. Tell me not uh, no, yeah. a chat room. People, yeah. people talk, I'm sure, you know. But the, it's one aspect that I train people is that, you know, do this. And it is so important, that even in the lower level things. I mean, there was a, somebody was phoned me up and said, what's an IP address? And I told them what an IP address is. They said, well, I was visiting this child porn website, and they said, um, moved all photos to Johnny's place. Strange IPs hit my site. And I, they said, what does that mean? I said, it means your story is over, you know. <laughs> and so people just do that. So, well, that's what I teach anyway. So do you think there is a way of resources in this day and age? Well, you've got to balance it with... Um, the need to protect them, the level of protection that they'll need. Because um, uh, you could scare them off. You know, they might just think, sorry, I don't know how to encrypt things. I don't know about virtual private networks. I've just got a story to tell. Uh, or they could be very they don't use enough um, security. They'll think, well, this person, you know, is not going to be able to protect me. So I don't think you can fully protect people. And, and there is this kind of, I was hoping Gavin would sort of explain there is this kind of confusion about if you do store notes uh, in an yeah, encrypted form and hide question, them, I think, if you, you know, uh, if you do store, I asked you about this earlier, but if you could explain to everyone else, Ooh. if you do store notes that, for example, reveal the names of your sources on an SD card and bury it in your grandmother's garden mm. in Daventry, you know, d <laughs> what, what rights do the police have to force you to A, reveal its existence and B, demand it and C, get the key? You know, I know that they, under Ripper that, Reaper, that they've got a lot of things, but it's just about whether they, if they don't know that it's there, what can they do about that? Okay, in other words, can they go on a fishing exercise? Is that yes, yeah. exactly what I mean. Well, that would be a digging exercise. A digging <laughs> exercise, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shopping enough. puns we and metaphors. Just, yeah. Stand corrected. You could throw it in a lake, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in, in the... In the um, in the judicial case where you're making an application to a judge for production order or a witness summons or something, you do have to be able to identify particular documents which you say the journalist has got uh, in his or her possession or on particular premises. Um, and uh, it's a complete no-no to alienate them or destroy them or bury them like a bone <laughs> after you've been put on notice that an application is going to be made to a judge for you to disclose those things. But you can do that beforehand. As and general so, tradecraft, that is what yes, you do. Yes, absolutely. And so what, you, what, what, your, what your BBC lawyer will do then is say when the, they come knocking on the door, which they will do in very general terms because they won't know exactly what you've got, is bugger off, serve an application on me with a witness statement saying what you say we have got how you know we've got it, where it is, and why it's relevant to your investigation. And a lot of them just go at that stage. A lot of them faced with that challenge um, just don't pursue the application. So that's, that's all well and good, but it's very inconvenient if you need to access the information because <laughs> you know, there's a follow-up story the following <laughs> Sunday. Um, Start digging the backyard. Yeah. But I mean, that's one of the realities that you're dealing with, isn't it, Gavin, that in, in having to advise um, clients that 
and, and lawyers are increasingly becoming involved in the processes of investigative journalism sort of as part of risk management. You know, if you are exposed and you have to defend this case and you have to consider the, the practical implications of destroying sources to protect yes. yourself. Yes, and that is yeah. a very, that is, I mean, it's not for me to say, you will know this. Um, you archive material as a journalist, good investigative journalists, and you use it further down the line, mm. maybe a long way further down the line. If your practice, if your self-defensive practice comes to, to destroy it or to bury it, um, you're denying yourself your own research material later on, and that's a very, very worrying trend if that starts to happen. Jonathan, can I ask, have you used Telegram? Well, telegram was the old-fashioned Telegram. I don't know. No, no, the, <laughs> the app. From the Queen. No, I don't think there, no. There's an app that is like, you know, a mess text messaging, but uh, A, it encrypts the communication, and B, it wipes it. You go into private mode, and as soon as you've had the conversation, it's, it's dis. Now, as a journalist, that's great because uh, it, and bad at the same time. I just think that, yes, you can engage the source really, really easily, even if they're a complete technophobe, if they've got a mobile device. You can have secure chat, but you can't preserve notes. That's the other side of it. But then you might not always want to preserve notes. I'm just sort of wondering if there's circumstances where you might desire there to be no kind of permanent record of things. Well, then you, don't, then you destroy your notes very quickly, or you don't take them in the first place. I mean, there, there are American <coughs> papers that uh, have a policy of actually, after, after doing a story, destroying all the material, um, which actually seems to me a bit severe. I mean, and you, and you, you'd want it for the future. And I can't, I really, I really, I mean, I can understand why you would, use, would do that. Uh, would do that. Um, as, a, as a safeguard, as, as an a insurance, safeguard, basically. Yes, yeah. <coughs> uh, I wonder now scary. if I'm... <laughs> We've got yeah. questions from the audience. I'm, I'm sure we do. There's one here. Um, Duncan Campbell went to the top of uh, the cathedral in St. George's to talk to Mordecai because he's under such total and complete security clampdown that even his lips are, re are red. Uh, so <laughs> I've seen the extremities of this. I do have a question. I kind of wondered about uh, Idealistic Blackberry having a security summit on the 26th of this month. They actually dream that they're going to uh, achieve total encryption. Oh, really? I mean, I, I hate all of this because I think we've got a constitutional crisis and the First Amendment has to be defended. Nobody in human rights is defending the First Amendment. Russ Bridger said to me he wished he'd had the First Amendment. Um, it's hard to be in the talking about this in this room because all these empty seats have got 10 security operations listening in on this and uh, <laughs> yes. probably a couple of the full seats as well. Um, I actually went to Washington uh, uh, recently and was talking to people in the intelligence agencies and I went up to... Corpus Christi, and uh, these people are so crafty, uh, they managed to sabotage me between two meetings with constitutional lawyers <laughs> in New York by saying that um, they, they contacted me saying they gathered I was having a meeting with General Nagata, that's the man in charge of attacking ISIS. So suddenly my second tele um, constitutional lawyer just shut down, I couldn't see him again. Uh, I want to ask you about jurisdiction on this question of this. You've got the Chinese, the Russians, and whatever. The only place where there's the First Amendment is America. Uh, we talk about the NSA, but the NSA seems to be pretty bad. I mean, when you're talking about UNESCO, I mean, where is jurisdiction in all this thing? I mean, if we're going to Fourth Amendment everywhere, everybody will be encrypted, and they can do that better than we can, so they will win. And we will have no newspapers, we will have no democracy, unless the only electorate we want is intelligence people. Um, so what about the rest of us? I mean, what can we hope for in terms of First Amendment for the world? I mean, I think when Google started out, they wanted world First Amendment. I mean, now they're being destroyed by law lawsuits and whatever. Um, where's all this leading in the long term? I mean, do you have any idea where are we going to have a first amendment? We're going to have freedom of speech of any description. Do you want me to? Yeah, I start do. with that. Do, do. I mean, there is. Uh, perhaps you might you might find this regrettable, but there is not going to be a move um, by UNESCO to try to bring about an international law that fixes this. I mean, I think it would be <laughs> extremely difficult to do that. What we are arguing is that there needs to be an a attempt. Uh, by journalists, that the law still has validity, uh, that it, it warrants strengthening, that states need to take action, need to recognise the severity of this problem when it comes to democratic discourse, if we're talking about democratic countries, or we're talking about media development in, in emerging democracies. Um, the idea is to try to uh, put a global focus on the problem, to try to get states themselves 
to recognise whether that is through education by um, through the publication of this study ultimately and the follow-up actions that occur, whether there's a recommendation that comes from Europe that follows it that, that then you know finds currency somewhere else. It's about triggering action and awareness um, as much as anything else. And I think we would also um, suggest that the media needs to report this. I mean, I know there have been um, examples of great reportage on this in the UK, um, in the US as well. It's not necessarily the case globally. Um, and there is a really important role for journalists, uh, publishers and editors to play in educating the public broadly around this threat so that it doesn't become like some kind of, you know, mystery act by the tinfoil hat brigade, but it is actually explained in terms of practical implications. And I do think we also have a responsibility to report publicly on our own industry and the risk to the kind of journalism we bring you, and we have been able to bring you for decades. I mean, what Jonathan was saying before, targeted surveillance has, you know, been a problem. That's why Woodward and Bernstein met in a dark car park. The difference now is the technology that is being deployed by intelligence agencies, by state actors, by co corporations, is um, it would arguably always a step ahead of the defensive mechanisms. So you have that problem, but you also also you you also have um, the, the reality that our that our journalism practice has advanced, and it's very difficult to wind it back. And you have mass surveillance, which is without transparency, without accountability. Um, so I think it's a combination of education, um, activism, perhaps. I know that's problematic for our Lipman-esque model of journalism as practice here and um, in the US and Australia, where I come from. But those things in combination with pressure being applied to states to, as the EU has done in several circumstances, and Gavin mentioned some of the cases. I mean, this study goes through a process of cataloguing all of, all of the major cases that have occurred since 2007 at a regional level and as much as we were able to capture them at a country level. And the reason this report is so large is because there has been a lot going on. Some of it is um, beneficial in terms of making arguments around the need uh, to strengthen protection for sources, you know, that goes to the need to expand protections to include digital data, for example, um, upholding, you know, the right to, um, for there to be some kind of um, appellability uh, when it comes to um, orders to, to force journalists to reveal sources or hand over data. So I'm sorry there's no kind of, <laughs> you know, short, short of um, the United Nations, you know, intervening to create a law, which I think is given the realities of geopolitics, unlikely, <laughs> these are the steps that we need to take. What I think we need to focus on too is that over the past uh, 12 months since I've been working on this um, study, you know, these issues intensively, the speed with which these developments are occurring, the number of cases that are emerging. I mean, I think I'm done and then 2015 arrives and there's another swathe of cases and incidents and raids and, you know, revelations. Um, so I think, you know, we have to keep on the story and we have to keep the pressure up on governments as many um, of the people in this room uh, have, have done um, in the past. And there needs to be a collaboration, I think, you know, between journalists. I know that sounds terribly Pollyanna-ish, but I think there needs to be a collaboration across, you know, boundaries when it comes to, you know, media houses' boundaries. Like, this is the issue for our times, you know, as far as um, I, I can see. <laughs> Do you feel an urgency, Jonathan, for this? I mean, do you, you're at the coal face, so do, I mean, do, you, do you feel that urgency or do, does it feel like you're sort of oh, doing just, it, I, so therefore... I can see that, I can see that it's incredibly important, really important. Uh, but in terms, of, in terms of what we do at the coal face, it's, it's very... I, I think the point I was trying to make is it's very, very difficult to, to protect yourself from um, all sorts of... Yeah. I mean, you, you can have all sorts of new technology yourself to counteract it, the trouble is that you're, not, you're never going to be as good at someone who's a, a proper hacker. And states are really good at hacking. Yeah. And so, you, so, so I suppose the point I was trying to make was that you, if, by keeping it simple, by, sort of, by somehow taking, yeah. doing your own housekeeping in, mm. in a Almost very, very straight, it. straight way, it's probably the only way to, um, uh, to really to defeat it at the moment. And even that... Just slow it down. It's perhaps. not foolproof. Yeah. Um, no. Is, is, is there a case for journalists to you know, organize the systems that can protect themselves together 
and use that as the standard mode of communication. Um, I mean, you mentioned encryption, and you said that if you encrypt, then you know you stand out. Mm. Well, if if all journalists, if, if their organisations invest in the technology and they encrypted as a matter of practice, then there'll be a lot more encryption about. And you know, maybe these things also, you know, you need to make the state aware that these are journalistic communications and have some level of protection. Um, and um, therefore, that that you argue they need to follow some process um, before they can access them. I think that, that it can't work like that, in my opinion. Uh, just if you all stand together, then you're a you know target-rich environment in a way. And also, the threat is continuously evolving, and the countermeasures uh, are also continuously evolving. I think there's best practice which can be taught. But the actual specifics of it um, have to be in a state of flux because the, the threats to our security and privacy and, uh, are, are, are changing the whole time. We need to be aware. We need to be, uh, understand some of the technical terms and be ready to engage with people that we trust that do know how to protect us. I think that's, that's really the key. Thanks. I'm not, I'm not sure why we're so diffident um, about being active and campaigning to defend our profession and our, and our position because that's exactly what we should do. I mean, there isn't an absolutely 100% safe technical means. We have to use political means, and we are. I mean, Gavin mentioned the Reaper. The Theresa May and the government are committed now to, uh, the, to uh, redraft the, the Reaper to put in assurances that cases of police officers seeking information about journalists have got to go to a judge. That has come because uh, there was a campaign run by the Press Gazette, which is the journalist news website and the journalist union and people like that. And, and that's the only thing you can do, apart from the, the element that no one's mentioned yet, which is journalists' own practice. Quite apart from the technicalities and the law, the important thing is journalists' own practice. Uh, um, the Bill Goodwin case happened because Bill Goodwin was a active young journalist who was supported by the NUJ who took the case to Strasbourg. And whatever, I mean, British, British journalists currently do not have a very high reputation, perhaps in kind of ethical and professional terms, but one thing that no British journalist would do is ever betray a source. And in fact, they will go to great lengths to defend a course. Even the most disreputable people will defend courses. They're, they're sources, I'm sorry. <laughs> And the purpose of source protection, after all, is to protect the sources. It's not to protect the profession or journalists, it's to protect the sources. So the important thing, surely, is for journalists to maintain their consciousness and their determination to do that and to use the law and technical means as best as possible and to secure legal protection from the agencies of the state as far as they can. My friend Caroline says, never pick a fight with anyone that buys ink by the barrel load. <laughs> and as journalists, we should be in the position to kind of vigorously, I mean, it might be a bit of an abuse of our position in a way, but vigorously, um, you know, make sure that uh, those checks are, if they have made a commitment to reform Reaper, that those checks and balances are included. Now, do good investigative journalism about these processes, about these debates. Hi, I'm Guy from uh, BBC News. Um, is there a cost issue here? Basically, doing investigations is expensive because of all these precautions that you have to take. Does that mean it's really more of a prerogative for you know newspapers rather than broadcasters? You're implying that newspapers are rolling in cash <laughs> compared, to, compared to public yeah. broadcasters. <laughs> Which country are we talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, I mean, investigative journalism is expensive, full stop, not because of those measures, because it takes time and, uh, and you know, often teams of people and it's, um, and, you know, fortunately, uh, we, are, we are fortunate that, you know, the newspapers are still investing in, in, uh, in investigative journalism. In fact, if anything, there's been a bit of a revival of it. Mm. I think actually the broadcasters are sort of letting us down to a certain extent on that. They're, they're really, really shrinking their, um, their investigative journalism co coverage. Um, but no, I, 
it's not, they, they are not the reasons why it's expensive. It's expensive because of the time and effort and you know, resources, the resources and needed. Bodies needed, et cetera. Although Lawyers. that, that, yeah, that did come up though in the research <laughs> that it is increasingly expensive to do <laughs> investigative journalism <laughs> because of the cost of Gavin Miller, you see. <laughs> but also <laughs> because of. Who is giving his time for free, it should be said. Um, yeah. But also because of the cost of training. Uh, and the cost of you know the technology the and technology is quite quite cheap well, by it can comparison. Be, but it's free well, a lot I, of it. I was thinking but about the, the idea of you know having to move your team a few months to a village. Yeah, a secure so location. Really, you know, uh, oh yeah, I mean that, that 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 obviously was more expensive to do it that way, and it was uh, you know, but actually the main cost is probably probably the yeah, people the doing that that amount of work which we would have done anywhere. Um, and but I think. There is, there is, I mean, that you, I mean, I pers I'm personally think that the biggest strangle on, on investigative journalism is, is this, our libel laws. I mean, they, they are, that's why the BBC is so frightened of quite often of, of running big investigations. Mm -hmm. That's why we get Gavin in, because, and Gavin's now doing pre-publication work to make sure that when, when a story goes out, it has all the sort of qualified privilege that's, that's in the New Defamation Act. Um, and so uh, that's our bigger, one of our bigger pro issues and problems. I don't think the New Defamation Act go goes far enough. And that was really interesting. You were talking about that earlier, about how much preventative work is actually going on behind the scenes. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. How, how long has that been going on? I mean, is, is it relatively new? or? Well, there's more and more of it. And um, uh, there's a cost-benefit uh, analysis here. You know, you get sued in a libel case, you could pay a million pounds out in costs, quite aside from the damages. So contrary to popular belief, investing in Miller QC at an early stage is <laughs> relatively <laughs> cost effective compared to that. <laughs> Sorry. <It's only> <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, can, can I just, there's a gentleman here who wants to ask him, but can, can I just say something else? I mean, I don't want to get apocalyptic about this, but I will. Um, <laughs> How good. I was in Macedonia in the autumn, which you, which yeah. you looked at, which yeah. is, um, it's like a stagnant journalistic pond. Everything there is dying. And I was there for an EU mission, because they seem to want to get into the EU, which is a laugh, but um, one has to go and do these scrutiny missions. And um, we had various meetings with various official journalistic bodies. And in the end, one always says, well, can we sit in a room somewhere in the Council of Europe or somewhere in the EU building with the journalists who were writing stuff on the internet that are not attached to publications or broadcasters? So we've got some of them in a room. I've done exactly the same thing in Azerbaijan for the, recently for the Brussels Commission. Sat down with them, talked to them. And we were, we were talking about all these journalistic standards in Europe and stuff. And I said to the EU people, look, can we, I never really, you don't ask the right question. The question you want to ask is, what's the position in relation to sources in this country? What's the position for journalists in relation to confidential journalistic sources? If you want to do a health check on a society and on, on, on journalism, that's the question you ask. So I said, I asked this, this group of people, and a lot of them are in Belgrade doing online journalism because they can't function in Macedonia. And they looked at me and they said, we don't have any sources. We don't have any confidential journalistic sources anymore. Five, six, seven years ago, we used to have them in government, in banks, in financial institutions, in big corporations. Um, but they're too scared now. They, they've got wind of what happens. And they've all gone into academia or stuff, and so they can't tell us anything. They just, <laughs> they just lecture about what you see. And um, that's the problem. I mean, that, that's where you end up. If you tip beyond a certain point, that's where you end up. And this is right on, this is in the middle of the EU. This is a country in the middle of the EU that wants to be part of it. So there's no underestimating the gravity of the problem. It's really, really serious. Are we tipping that way? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But, but we have to be constantly vigil vigilant. I, I mean, I don't think we are, but we have to be constantly vigilant mm -hmm. to make sure we recognize that danger. Globally. We don't, but the British journalists don't like that. They've got a strong grip. They think that 
Oh, uh, listen, these people had a lot of guts. These people had plenty of guts about them. Believe me. Uh, I mean, it's in some ways, it's much harder to do the job in this sort of environment. Harder to do the job in a country like that. Absolutely. In Azerbaijan, they plant drugs on you, or you know, they they call you, you a they, they're <laughs> public order, and you go. So it, it is it is much harder, but you just can't do it without confidence from journalistic sources. You can't do the job. You can't produce the material. Uh, my name is Mark Hollingsworth. Uh, I just want to uh, mention that it's quite dangerous to delete your data or any emails, I would say, when you're doing a story because if you do that, then you're very vulnerable in a libel action or defamation case because you can't <coughs> then defend the case. You, you know, lawyers will come to you and say, we've got to defend this libel action. If you've deleted your data and email, then you, you're in serious trouble. That goes to your point, doesn't it? Right. And then secondly, I just want to ask Jonathan about the legal side of it, particularly on the story you did on FIFA, because as you say, it was based on thousands, if not millions, of documents and emails. Yeah. And it just seems to me that, uh, I want to ask you about the legal side of that, because in the old days, we would just get documents either anonymously or through source, you can just say documents, but now in stories, I did something recently for your paper, you'd say, you actually say, we have thousands of stories based on emails, so the implication of that is, well, how did you get these emails? The implication of that. Regimes of terror that are absolutely making all sources dry up, regardless of the courage of journalists. And basically, turning to this questual norm and this technological revolution. If you would just speak some more, how, what you think might be. This is political will again, yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, there is a, uh, there, it's, it's terrible, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I have spoken to politicians in, who have been in senior ministerial positions who've been on the committee. You say, look, you know, off the record, it's really easy to get the books. The books turn up. You know, the moment you get into a position of power, they knock on their door and they say, hmm. Now, you don't know what the threat is, and you don't know what will happen if we don't have these powers and we can't act. But we do, and we do that you need to be on our side. And if you're not, you'll regret it. And they will go, ooh, you're right, fair enough, okay, you know, that's a known unknown, <laughs> I'll behave. And that's a, it's a big cultural problem with, with politicians in our country. In our country, in Australia, too. Well, funny enough, that's the point I was going to make, and obviously um, it's the anniversary of 7-7 today, and uh, I think I heard the head, head, head of MI5 this morning somehow saying that there's no way they could have stopped it, but hang on, they've stopped a heck of a lot of really much more important incidents since then, and we should 50, be really grateful. 50, I think he said. Did he say 50? 50. Okay. 50. And obviously, they're just grasping onto this paranoia, and it's just going to help, it, uh, as, just, as Gavin was just saying, enable the establishment to bulldoze through. Mm. Yes, they can, uh, you, know, you have the point of, I haven't done anything wrong, so I don't care if they read my emails, but I don't want anybody reading my emails, frankly. You know, but it is this, as you say, nebulous war on terror. Mm. And you know, every single day, Tunisia, you know, these anniversaries, it's not getting any better. And they're, they're going to go down that way, I think. Yeah. When, it, when I was a small boy, <laughs> my favourite cartoon was a cartoon of a man in a in a um, in a in a colonial outfit with a with a big blunderbuss gun, and a little boy coming up to him, and he said, "What? What's that?" And the guy says, "It's an elephant." The little boy says, there aren't any elephants in this country. And the man says, aha, that proves it's working. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel so much like the same as Australia. that cartoon when I hear the security services coming out with that sort of stuff. You know, that is their line, the elephant gun line, I'm afraid. Indeed. And when they expand, again, with an Australian anecdote, but as they have done in, uh, in my country, in, in Fowler's um, homeland, um, expanded national security legislation to incorporate all information about asylum seeker arrivals and uh, what goes on inside asylum seeker detention centres, as they're referred to, onshore and offshore. So to try and do investigative journalism now based on s confidential sources, and increasingly it's necessary to rely on confidential sources, mm. but they've now criminalised the revelation exactly. of such information by confidential sources, including doctors, educators for whom it has previously been compulsory to declare uh, you know, abuse such or, abuse. Yeah. Um, so this is, this, you know, when you, when you are in a situation where democratic countries like, like Australia, which claim a proud tradition despite an absence of constitutional protections for freedom of expression, claim a proud tradition of it, 
and you see these battles going on and they will, but sort of active um, yeah, you know, agitation shut it down. exactly a, against uh, such reportage. Um, I think you, you recognise that we are in a you know a very difficult um, situation, and, and this this study looks at you know at countries that we would have reported <laughs> being despotic, you know, um, as as being um, uh, in need of um, democratising. But these things are happening in our midst, and Five Eyes countries, as they're referred to, the five countries um, in the alliance known as the Five Eyes, who share intelligence material, Australia, the UK, New Zealand, Canada, and the US, um, represent you know, a significant number of cases where there have been breaches and where there are problems identified. So, you know, um, again, without wanting to be apocalyptic about it. It's quite a popular apocalyptic. <laughs> oh yeah, which should trigger action, you know? I think, I think that's the point, you, you do the best you can and you go down to the wire fighting it every step of the way, whether you're a journalist or you're a lawyer. You don't want to lose this battle. I think we've got time for one more. Just one more. Yeah. <laughs> um, for me, this is obviously, in my opinion, just another example of black letter law not being able to keep up with digital um, evolution. So, um, I mean, Gavin, you mentioned here in the UK that it's very unfortunate there are no particular shield laws for journalists. We have some shield laws, specific shield laws in Australia in some jurisdictions. Um, it's a uniform shield law that's been enacted in certain states. And yet, I don't think there's been in any judicial reliance on, upon that yet. There has um, in Western Australia. Okay. Western and so my question really is for you, Julie. Do you think in black letter law are really going to, from your research, um, are really going to make a difference or it's just, it's just too far beyond that now? I think, I think there is, I mean, look, you know, I'm optimistic. <laughs> optimistic about the future of journalism. I think investigative journalism has to find a way. Um, Janine Gibson, formerly of The Guardian and now I think of BuzzFeed, um, said to me in an, in an interview, and she was, of course, um, heading up the, the investigation um, into the Snowden files for The Guardian in the US. She said, we are like cockroaches as, as investigative <laughs> journalists. We, we must survive this. You know, we have to keep going. I know it's a problematic um, <laughs> metaphor, <laughs> but, nice. but I, it really resonated. And so I'm, I'm saying I'm optimistic because I think ultimately we can establish the vital importance of uh, investigative journalism, accountability journalism, you know, journalism that exposes scandals like FIFA, journalism that exposes, uh, you know, the Watergate uh, situation, the Snowden investigation in years to come, catalogued <laughs> among, among those, um, probably even by the, the, the journalistic detractors of those stories. So um, I think that black letter law in combination with education, in combination with um, legislation that recognises the need to ensure um, that uh, shield laws where they do exist encompass digital acts of journalism, um, that they are not systematically overridden by anti-terrorism and national security legislation, that there is judicial oversight, that there is transparency, that there is um, appellability you know, built into these processes. I think there's a long way to go before we give up on the research. So yeah, I, I don't know if you guys would, uh, would agree with that position. But I, I, think the, I think the worst thing to do in this situation is become nihilistic about law and the value of law. I mean, you can be realistic about it, but don't be nihilistic about it. Mm. Um, you know, point. what, okay, so, <laughs> so, but, so my point about the shield law is if there is this huge thing called the UK shield law, right, which there isn't, there's one section and one statute and some European law. Um, what you see happening in a case like the Tom Newton Dunn case, which is, which is sim put simply, the police say, we didn't know about any of that law, right? We actually didn't know mm. that these were the European standards. They can't do that. They can't pull that one. They can't pull the ignorance one if it's a big black letter law. You can't moan about the rule of law and breaches of the rule of law unless you've, <laughs> unless you've got good, big, clear, certain laws. And then you've got the bastards because if they don't comply with it, you know, you've got something to use against them. So I think it's as an instrument of protection and change. It's it's at, you know it doesn't work immediately or in every situation. I think we've allowed one more. Sorry, one more. <laughs> um, I was going to ask about uh, something fairly simple: the good, the bad, and the ugly, Julie. Whether you can break down your report and actually tell us who and who isn't. <laughs> I imagine my homeland, Australia, is down the bottom there somewhere. Um, but. In fact, the more I listen to you Same guys, list. the more I'm wondering whether this is actually a discussion about 
technology or political will, which is a threat the way you're talking doesn't appear to be the technology itself. It appears to be government. It appears to be a decision to, to clamp down, to, to regress, really. I'm just wondering how you see whether the, the greatest threat is, is, is digital technology or whether it's government, whether it's... Um, look, I can't, uh, I can't give you a breakdown on, you know, countries performing well, countries not performing well in terms of, you know, who, who is most evil when it comes to um, undermining source protection. What I can say, um, and this study is still in finalisation, so, you know, there's the caveat, but what I can say is that it's a global... You know, it, and that's what I've sort of tried to demonstrate with the examples from, you know, countries that, that we regard as, you know, as far as freedom of expression goes. Um, I think it's both digital, um, and there are positive elements to the digital that I think we need to take into account, which we haven't mentioned yet, that the digital revolution has made investigative journalism, even investigative journalism dependent upon leaks, um, much easier if you, if you listen to some... Um, of those who are practicing currently, um, you're nodding, um, Jonathan, but also Jared Ryle, who's the um, director of the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists, which is based in the US, um, told me that you know he thinks this in some ways, as much as there are these threats that we've acknowledged, this is also the golden age of investigative journalism. Yeah. Times, yeah. Because you don't have to rely on that face-to-face -face meeting necessarily in the car park to be handed, you, you, or you, you have the meeting, that might also involve being handed a USB stick, which has a great cache of um, you know, files on it that assist in your, your reporting. So I think we need to keep He that got a huge cache, didn't he? <laughs> Daryl Ryle. Yes, he did. Yeah. He did. I mean, yeah, we look, <laughs> we look at those, those, those stories when it comes, to, you're referring to the, um, you know, the, offshore the Swiss leaks, leaks offshore leaks, the Luxembourg bank, leaks, yeah. a whole range of leaks. Um, that have been in part, um, you know, dependent on this this age of reporting that relies on digital interactions with sources. So there's that, but it's 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 a combination um, of those factors and the political climate that in the post September 11 environment, we have um, states who appear to be increasingly determined to respond to threats by curtailing freedom of expression and. You know, and source protection is in the midst of that. Everything seems to intersect at that point, all of the threats that we've sort of been discussing. Um, so therefore, you know, coming back to that point about the role for journalism, partly it involves activist journalism in the form of keeping governments accountable and, and educating communities about the importance and the value of investigative journalism that's dependent on those sources who we... In some, we, not me personally, but journalists in, you know, in many countries risk their lives, as do the sources, to, to bring um, exposés to light uh, that have you know, f capacity to, to bring about dramatic change, potentially. So I think it's a combination of factors. say thank you to you all for coming and thank you very much to our four panellists and to Julie um, for reporting on, on this very interesting thank research. You. Please thank look you out for the much. full report. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Julie.